topic. I'm going to talk to you about why are doctors so miserable? So bear with me on this and I hope there'll be time. I don't know whether you do Q&A. So many of you might know I've been working with mentally ill doctors for more than 15 years now. And it still surprises me why so many become unwell and why doctors have such high rates of mental illness. Doctors in the main, whatever we say, have a rewarding career. We have good social networks, we have high status, we have financial security, and we've got flexibility in our working lives. Yet if you just cast your mind back to a few years ago with the junior doctor strike, one of the overwhelming set of placards was illustrated the prevailing mood of doctors, which is one of being demoralized, depressed, and devalued. So let me just briefly then for the next 20 minutes or so look at why doctors feel so much like that. Well, of course, there are many factors, uh, but let's look at probably the first one, which is the most important risk factors for doctors developing mental illness is the job, the job they do, the job we do. Medicine is a hard taskmaster. It's intellectually, physically, and emo emotionally very demanding. And it's not only the unsocial hours or long shifts that make it so, it's not even the vast amount of knowledge that we have to remember. One would say that my son, who's a, a lawyer, has to remember the equivalent of dozens of telephone directories. So it's not just that. It's also not just the omnipresent fear of errors or litigation or complaints. No, but what makes medicine so difficult is that we have to deal with human suffering and all of its attendant emotions. Many years ago, the sociologists, Harold Leaf and Rene Fox, wrote about medicine as, and I quote, exploring, examining, and cutting into the human body, dealing with fears, anger, sense of hopelessness, helplessness, and the despair of patients, meeting emergency situations, accepting the limitations of medical science in dealing with chronic or incurable disease, being confronted with death itself. So working with people is complicated. It's deeply satisfying, but it's also psychologically very painful. Patients bring their unique history, their expectations, their beliefs and desires into the consulting room. They bring their emotions, joy, sadness, shock, fear, aggression, worries, and everything else wrapped up in being mortal. And in the space of seconds, using all of our senses, we have to become attuned to their needs. For those brief moments, we become guests in their lives as they share with us their most intimate secrets, secrets that they may well never have told anyone else. So patients often stir up powerful feelings in us, in which in the main have to be understood rather than responded to. These feelings, which are not always generated directly from the patient per se, but can be due indirectly to our own personal experiences brought through to life through our, through our encounter with our patients. So for example, a doctor whose father might have been abusive might himself experience, have those experiences reopened by someone who is violent in the accident and emergency department. Now, any of you that study psychiatry will recognize this as transference and counter-transference, and both occur with any doctor-patient interaction. Patients can also create very powerful negative emotions in us, not because they remind us of anybody or past experiences, but just because the patient themselves is dislikable or difficult or rude. They may be drunk, violent, demanding, or engage in activities which society might deem unacceptable. And some of us may feel guilt if we harbor these negative feelings and loathe and are often loath to admit to such emotions, except I would say in the safety of support groups or individual supervision, both of which are largely lacking in mainstream medicine. Irrespective of how we feel or how tough a day we've had or the traumas we've endured or the sorrows waiting for us at the end of the day, 
In the consulting room, we must always be engaged with the patient, attentive to their needs, objective and professional. The day my mother died, I had to finish a busy clinic. It was too late to delegate the session to someone else. Though I imagine this says more about my failing in accepting vulnerability than in the patient's responses had I cancelled. Despite my grief, I had to focus on my patients. I had to make them my first concern. And this is what I understand to be the emotional labour of our work, and it's hard. It's about managing or suppressing our personal feelings so they don't interfere with the act of caring or of giving to others. It's the emotional labour which accompanies the work of doctors that places them at particular risk of mental illness. The smiling waitress asking, have you had a nice day? When she herself has had a terrible one, is similar to the doctor maintaining their composure when confronted with patients or situations which make them recoil in fear or disgust. On the surface level, emotional labour means that the professional controls or changes their emotional reaction so that the observer, in this case the patient, is not able to recognise what he or she really feels. And it is this mismatch between what one expresses and what one feels that leads to anxiety, depression and burnout. But there are many other reasons why medicine is so tough. Where medicine becomes truly difficult is that our job is about essentially about managing human expectations and dealing with the suffering that our patients project into us. These projections find fertile grounds and given doctors desire to care, easily become located within the medical profession. Patients see doctors when they are most vulnerable. They come wanting to be given hope and for us to contain their fear of death and even to prevent it. And you've seen this throughout the COVID pandemic. The desire for immortality is a collective fantasy held by our patients and the public. The unconscious belief is that death can be prevented by the power of medicines or operations or interventions. Death is the shadow of all healthcare. And while services are generally geared to saving life, to saving and prolonging life, the spectre of death is never far away. Most hospitals, if you think about it, have morgues on site. The psychoanalyst Anton Oblaza, of Olza has suggested that the NHS and probably all health systems should be more accurately called keep death at bay service, articulating our dependency on the blood in an omnipotent service which can meet our most vulnerable and primitive needs. I, I have to call you back. We're in the middle of a medical association lecture. I'll call you at nine. Okay. I think somebody's left their mute, mute on. Mervyn, I think you're you need to put yourself on mute. So yeah, I apologize. Can I get off the screen? It's my fault, sorry. Okay. So just going back, I was saying that patients uh, want us to contain their fear of death. And I see this so often in my working life. So for example, patients at the end of their life, terminally ill with cancer, whose relatives will call 999 at the 11th hour, demanding their loved one is taken to their deathbed in hospital, hoping that medicine can give them one last chance of treatment, only for them to die on a casualty trolley. The psychoanalyst Isabel Menzies Leith wrote in the 1950s, how society defends itself from the problems it finds too difficult to deal with. And it does this by locating and then disavowing associated anxieties into institutions such as hospitals, nursing homes and prisons. And once split off from normal consciousness, the leftover anxiety is acted out through either idolizing or denigrating those who have taken this unpalatable, unpalatable task away from them. And it's no surprise to me, therefore, that my specialty, general practice, is increasingly portrayed as both a scapegoat and the saviour the, of the NHS. 
as health leaders locate their fear of the very survival of the health service into us. It might also explain why paediatricians, so often seen as the darlings of the health system, but now, as medicine is keeping alive children with chronic and complex disease, paediatricians are increasingly the recipients of verbal abuse, litigation and complaints. Parents project into them their emotions of having an imperfect child, and paediatricians accept and must deal with these painful projections. Holding these emotions for others is psychologically difficult, yet largely unspoken about. So is confronting the shadow side of our work day in, day out, and learning to cope with the knowledge that we will always fail our patients, always. And that failure is a quintessential part of medicine. Now this is a hard lesson to learn, and it needs support, supervision, and spaces to explore our feelings, all of which are sadly lacking in the modern health system. As other causes, doctors' place in society is changing, as is their ability to practice their craft, uncluttered by market or external forces, such as inspection or monitoring. I was brought up to believe that medicine is an art underpinned by science. But learning to strike the right balance isn't easy, and failure to do so creates anxiety. And across the world, we're facing something of a crisis in healthcare, with doctors made to focus on the disease rather than on the patient, on the science rather than on the caring. And as medicines becomes a numbers game of measurement, monitoring and productivity, it risks negating the individuality of the patient and the creativity of the doctor. Writing about GPs, the geriatrician Stephen Illiff talks about the dissonance created as the role of medicine changes from a craft concerned with the uniqueness of each encounter with an ill person to a mass manufacturing industry preoccupied with the throughput of the sick. And what he's articulating, which many others have also, is the loss of the professional of ideal, of the doctor having a special relationship with their patient. So it's hardly surprising that doctors are unhappy. Now doctors are at risk of mental illness, especially now so, as many of the protective factors within organizations have been lost, which might have acted as a ballast to work-related distress. Some of you may know Harold Ellis, a surgeon who qualified in 1948, who also taught me as a medical student. And he recalled in the BMJ his time of working as a doctor in the hospital as a very positive experience. He described that having ne never been off on call, he was, always, he was on a one in one, yet he had fond memories. We all knew each other. The firm was a happy band of brothers. When one reads first person accounts such as these, Doctors written by that generation, they talk of teams and how well supported they felt by their peers and small medical firms, which actually was my experience. These interactions between colleagues were invaluable, offering not just access to education, but gave me support and a sense of belonging. My hospital had a doctor's mess and even a doctor's dining room, and we could eat our meals and share our stories without the fear of being overheard. I felt I belonged, not just to my firm, but to the hospital. How doctors are being treated today though has changed over several decades. Ellis woke every morning with breakfast delivered to his room by a porter. His shoes had been polished overnight and other doctors were given free accommodation, all meals, laundry and a maid service to the doctor's mess. Now, certainly pre-pandemic, doctors barely even had a hook to hang their coats on, let alone hot meals and a room to rest in. Training has now become atomized, and rather than coming together, doctors are at risk of becoming singletons, only capable of defending their own psychological skin. And patients have changed, which adds to our risk of mental illness. Patients are living longer with chronic illnesses, and the proliferation of Dr. Google and online patient communities is leading to greater equality between doctors and patients, as patients are now becoming participants in rather than mere objects of medical decision-making. Doctors, of course, are encouraged to share decision-making, to co-create uh, treatments with their patients, and doctors are encouraged to become less authoritarian. 
But as this unconscious hierarchy between patients and doctors is disappearing, doctors are having to adapt to their new position as equals and not superiors. Now, many professions, including law and teaching, have also become constrained and changed, especially by corporate structures, resulting in loss of autonomy, status and respect. And all professions now work in more complex structures rather than the old fashioned corner shop of GPs, such as I started, or of lawyers. But as the Princeton sociologist Paul Starr writes, for most of the 20th century, medicine was the heroic exception that, sus that sustained the waning tradition of independent professionalism. But the exception may now be brought into line with the governing rule. There are other risk factors. We know, of course, that doctors' easy access to prescription drugs and their knowledge of how to use them explains the higher risk of addiction amongst anaesthetists, accident emergency doctors and dentists. And doctors too play their part. Individuals who enter medical school are drawn from a highly selected group. We have to pass difficult entrance exams involving excellent ex examination results and a challenging interview. Aspiring applicants need to show determination, intelligence, ability to work under pressure, to be good communicators and demonstrate a desire to care. More so than when I gained a place at medical school, prospective doctors also had to be, have, a flaw, have flawless school reports. And those who got through all of these hoops shared a common set of attributes, which were deemed to foster the making of a good, doctors, good doctor. And these include being patient, unselfish, responsible and highly ethical. And in the face of demands, individuals must not show weakness or indecision and must always put others first. Now, these formidable attributes can become exaggerated, leading to doctors becoming less tolerant of errors in themselves or their colleagues and never feeling good enough. And this can result in a vir virtual circle of failure, procrastination, obsessive checking and seeking constant reassurance. And symptoms can become so overwhelming that self-doubt may develop in depression or anxiety. Perfectionism is also a very common feature of doctors and this drive for flawlessness and high standards places them at increasing risk of being overly self-critical. Perfectionists are welcomed within, uh, within our, 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 our tribe because they tend to have low threshold for errors. But perfectionism also risks burnout, depression and anxiety. And far from producing better outcomes, research has shown that perfectionism can lead to more detrimental work and non-work outcomes, as well as higher risk rates of mental illness. There are other psychological vulnerabilities common in doctors which have been identified, including our excessive sense of responsibility, our desire to please everyone, our guilt for things outside one's own control, which again is played out during COVID with the moral injury, our constant self-doubt and our obsessive compulsive traits. The desire to study medicine, as with all choices, is influenced by conscious and unconscious motivations. Consciously, the most obvious reason is because the individual is good at science, what we say at our interview, and wants an interesting career helping others. Unconscious components are important as well, especially as they might predict why some individuals are more at risk of developing mental illness than others. Whilst the unconscious motivations are mainly speculative, there is some evidence to suggest that a desire to make reparation for traumatic childhood experiences is an important component, and this might be the root of motivation. I became a doctor due to my admiration for my father, a GP. However, despite my idolization of him, or perhaps alongside it, I might have needed to get closer to him. He left home as my parents separated when I was a young child. By fostering a love of medicine and all that went with it meant that I had a legitimate reason to spend more time with him. I could visit him in his surgery. I could go on home visits with him and I could spend many hours with him talking about medicine. My attachment to him, and I'm sure to mine, I'm sure his to mine grew and I felt special. So it's no surprise therefore that I became a doctor. Anything else might have felt a betrayal. A medical career might give individuals the information and skills to resolve previous conflicts, 
as well as providing the opportunity to care for others and to give to others the care and attention they wished they would have themselves. Now, these aren't bad motives, but there is evidence that these students might present with more mental health problems when particular clinical experiences resonate with earlier conflicts. Choosing medicine in part to repair childhood experiences might predispose them to emotional distress and psychiatric illness. The desire to heal a loved one and the guilt associated with failing to do so can become channeled into a relentless drive to care more, to be more altruistic and to work harder. And if unchecked, this will not lead to reparation or healing, but instead risks repeating the failure to cure, to cure the uncurable, which further feeds the associated emotional drive to apply oneself to an, emotion, to an impossible task. This doesn't mean that these individuals shouldn't become doctors. I flourished in my career, I hope I have anyway, and I hope I've been a good enough doctor to my patients. Having experience of personal trauma might predispose individuals to a real gift and capacity for empathy and caring, especially uh, if these childhood conflicts can be acknowledged and the vulnerability held in awareness. And there is some evidence for this done by Firth Cousins, where she found that those students who were more depressed, both as students and as house officers, tended to be more empathic, more self-critical and more internal to their attributions than their peers, all of which would appear to be desirable attributes to doctors to possess. So you can see that in this brief talk, I've touched on individual factors as to why doctors might be more at risk, their personality, their search for meaning, their access to medications and drugs, which others may not. I've touched on aspects related to work, the fact that front of house and back of house, medicine is a hard, a hard job to do. And I've talked about the emotional impact of the job that we do, which can never be underestimated. And also the wider socio-political factors, which is driving more perfection, more fear of errors, and uh, more fear of litigation. I'll end by saying this. What's probably the most surprising factor of the last 15 years of myself managing doctors with mental illness is not how many doctors become mentally ill, but actually how few doctors become mentally ill. Thank you very much. You're on mute, David. Yeah, thank you very much for covering an area which um, is not often spoken about. Um, it's the last point that you made, of course, puts us into perspective absolutely perfectly, um, as we always talk about the small number that do come to attention rather than the, rather, rather than the others maybe need our help and assistance. Now, um, the uh, customary situation with Henry Cohen would be, have been to have taken you to Israel uh, beforehand, and as I've said in our introduction, there's a rain check for that. And of course, um, we have Israeli colleagues, Professor uh, Shimon Glick particularly, who um, has touched on some of the issues that you've mentioned in relationship to uh, personal autonomy. And uh, I look forward to the opportunity of you uh, having, a, uh, having a chance to talk to him on such a visit, because it really is a, a subject of great interest to him. Um, I'd like to now hand over to Ian, um, who's going to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you, David. Um, and Claire, thank you very much for delivering such a wonderful talk. Um, we're very lucky and honoured for you to be able to find the time to give us this talk, uh, not just because of all the stresses uh, Omicron is causing to all of us at the moment, but because of all your other commitments. Um, and with regard to David's comments earlier about the symmetries of speakers this year, my wife, Liz and me, you and your husband, Simon, um, both giving uh, talks and being presidents. I, I remember a further symmetry that many years ago, Simon and I worked together as medical students on a couple of medical student magazines. And this was over 40 years ago. Um, also, when Simon spoke to uh, the association, I was very amused by his shtick of when he spoke to us pretending he hadn't come prepared and then gave a very illuminating talk on mental health and stress. And I note in contrast, you had a more orthodoxly written down your talk 
but I won't dare to comment on which technique is better. <laughs> I, don't, I dare you. <laughs> he wants to I dare you not. I'm sure that your dinner time conversation is always lively between the two of you and also challenging. But I wonder to myself whether any of your children have followed in your and your husband's footsteps by going into medicine or if, like me and Liz, you've successfully put them off. And I note um, that you said earlier, um, with further symmetry, that like our children, you have at least one child who's become a lawyer. But I don't know what occupations your other children have followed. Social worker. <laughs> that easy job. The other one's become a ch child protection social worker. Uh, well, that's that's not easy at all. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> uh, and um, I, I'm sure that even before you gave this talk, most of us listening could have given you a whole host of reasons why doctors are so miserable this year um, and this week in particular. Um, and, and I also wondered that are we by nature uh, miserable as a group of people? But your talk has given us much more insight into this topic. Um, many of us would have given mainly superficial reasons um, for being so miserable at the moment or in the, even the long term, but you've highlighted more substantial and more serious causes. And I was also struck when I was involved in selecting GPs on the Northwick Park BTS scheme, how many applicants had experienced some form of serious medical trauma in their youth, and clearly this had affected their choice of career. But I was particularly struck by your comment we will always fail our patients and that failure is an intrinsic part of medicine. And I don't suppose I dwelt on that um, really much, but it's, it, it's really quite true. Um, and, and, and even when we retire, we get uh, uh, castigated. I remember Oliver Samuel, who was uh, the uh, doyen of general practice BCSs and set up the North Hill Park one. He wrote an article in the BMJ when he retired about how many complaints he got from patients um, because, he, because he'd retired and how he was letting them down um, by going into retirement. Um, and like many of us, I'm sure that most of us who qualified over 20 years ago regret the passage of the firms and the teamwork that that invoked, which, uh, as you pointed out, gave us much greater peer support than is currently available to uh, our current crop of uh, hospital, particularly hospital doctors. Um, and, and I'm sure uh, that's something that uh, really we should, as a profession, look to change back because it, it not only affects how GPs work, uh, how doctors work, I think it also affects continuity of care. And it's interesting to note that in a recent <coughs> BJGP article about two months ago, um, it showed that if a, a patient sees the same doctor continually um, for 15 years, their life expectancy is significantly increased and their risk of admission to hospital goes down by 25%. And this is clearly something that we've lost in the NHS, as you say, we're too uh, focused on numbers. And as Einstein once said, not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. You clearly have a unique perspective in this very important topic being instrumental in setting up a variety of support services for doctors, mental health and stress issues. And I really take my hat off to you because it's, it's a very difficult area to work in. But once again, many thanks for giving us such an illuminating talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ian. There's words, um, I suppose, looking at the people on the screen. I'm the only one who has a child heavily in medicine and um, maybe that's because I kind of withdrew into the laboratory. Um, that, that may be the reason, but of course then uh, pathologists also have quite, quite high incidence of mental illness as much of the data has shown. And um, thank you, Ian, for your words of, uh, of, of, of gratitude to Claire. And uh, I think you really summarized uh, what all those who are fortunate enough to have heard you uh, tonight uh, feel. Um, final com final uh, way ahead comment is that we have a special event coming on the subject of Omicron, which you'll be receiving notice for. Um, that will be on Sunday night, unusually, because we have a speaker from Southern Africa to talk about uh, the new virus. And, um, and yeah, I hope as many of you as possible will be able to join that. 
thank you, Claire. Thank you, Ian. And apologies again for any- David, we have a question. There's a question on the chat. I don't know if, if um, Professor Garada will take that. Somebody's put a question on the chat, which I could ring up. Read up. Uh, could you talk about the balance between letting some patients get under our skin and become ghosts that remain with us versus having some thick armor that no one can penetrate our personal professional defenses? Um, anonymous attendee. That's a very, very good question. I mean, what the question's referring to is psychological defenses. And I didn't have time to, you know, to talk about the protective factors and everything, but what we learn during medical school, what we have to learn is a whole suite of psychological defenses. Otherwise, we would cry every time a patient got sick or died. We would vomit every time we saw cancer or even put needles, put a needle in, in a vein. And we learn these essentially in the front of house on ward rounds, but we also learn it through modeling and modeling with our peers. And the most common psychological defenses, which is like psychological PPE, if you think about it, PP, psychological PPP, PPE, God, even I've forgotten, personal protective equipment. And the most common one is denial, because, you know, we, we, the denial that, that somebody's unwell, even denial our own vulnerability. But there's another one, depersonalization, which is the classic, uh, the liver in bed 10, which isn't a very kind uh, defense mechanism, but again, it is a defense me mechanism that doctors learn. Now, if your defenses become too much, then your psychological armor becomes far too robust and actually you start to lose empathy and you lose the capacity for, for engaging with a patient. If it's too little, then you really can't survive and you weep and you, you take each patient home with you. And there is a sweet spot, a real sweet spot that, uh, where the this and it's called uh, where, where you can actually have if you like empathic detachment where you can detach from the patient but you remain empathic in some way and you keep them in mind but in a way that you can continue with your daily lives and, and go home and it's a lesson that if you had a group of young doctors they're still learning and the sad thing is that if we don't allow young doctors to be mixing with older doctors to be able to express the fact that they find it difficult to leave the patient at the at the front door of the hospital if we don't give them the space and the time to talk about their own guilt about that then they can never learn this how to get this sweet point of, of detachment and and they can it risks burnout it means risks depression and we see this in particular amongst pediatricians who uh, i think have a greater empathy for kindness than most doctors but have to also learn uh, psychological detachment otherwise they can't do their job so yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 things that are learned. There are other ways of learning uh, how to how to not take patients home metaphorically, having effective work life balance, having mentoring, having supervision, uh, having good rostering, taking annual leave, all of which are, are pretty impossible at the moment with COVID. But nevertheless, these they are as healthy skills to learn as learning to use uh, a gym uh, to keep your body fit. So. It is important. And what I would say is that all doctors should have access to supervision. And sadly, we don't. I mean, only psychoanalysts, psychotherapists do, uh, because it is, I think, the most the best way of answer, of, of striking that balance between uh, being overly engaged and, 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 and being too hard on, and, and far too hard. And so I hope that's answered the question. Uh, sufficiently. If you read my book, by the way, Beneath the White Coat, Doctors, Their Minds and Mental Illness, all proceeds to charity, Doctors in Distress, uh, I write a lot about this. Is that all right, David? I'll put it in the chat. Thank you very much. Many can thanks. I, can I just add that uh, on the GP training scheme at Northwick Park, half of, the, half of each weekly session was spent in a balance group. Yes. Uh, and the whole point of balance was to express one's feelings about uh, one's relationship with patients, particularly exploring those deep feelings that some patients sort of caused us. And we found that extremely therapeutic as well as educational. And in fact, for a short time, we, we tried to introduce it into our hospital junior doctor colleagues who also found it helpful, but unfortunately the pressure of time hasn't allowed that to carry on. But, but the ballot uh, uh, circles and, and schemes were extremely important to help us in our training to cope with those sorts of problems. Quite right, Ian. I've been in a balance group now for my sick doctor service for 14 years. And 
it's I think it's saved us saved our lives I can't think of anything else that because patients stick to you like velcro they stick to you what that sticking isn't belonging to you it belongs to them they've thrown it at you and unless you understand that it doesn't belong to you in a safe space like a balance group then you can you can start to have all sorts of paranoid ideation about yourself not being a good enough doctor not understanding them properly it, it doesn't belong to you it belongs to the patient or at least it's a doctor patient relationship which is of course what balance does but yes bring back balance which of course brings me to Lottie Newman, involved in valent groups as well, and Adrian Afton, who was the head of involved, who were uh, stalwarts of the exception. And Andrew Elder, who leads our balance group for practitioner health, who I'm sure you all know. Yes, yes. I mean, that's a very important uh, part, of, part of the history was the existence of balance groups that worked with. David, I'm losing you. I, I can't hear you very well. Sorry, it's a long time ago that these the, the, the stalwarts of the association were involved in the ballot groups. And um, it, 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 I think it troubled some of them that an immunopathologist was somehow um, playing, playing a role when he, he wasn't in quite the same, the same league. But um, uh, really, I, I thank you very much once again. And uh, we're absolutely, we're proud that we've been able to listen to this lecture and to listen to your response to the question now. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And good luck with all your other endeavours. Take you. lots of love, everybody. Keep safe, get your booster, et cetera, et cetera. And be nice to GPs. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>